Welcome to my genealogy experiment. My name is Michelle Anderson. It is really, really cold here today, so we're going to hope that I can say what I want to say so that I can get to editing. Like last week, you may hear my dogs and maybe my cats. They still think that I'm talking to them and that I want them to be with me. So hopefully they won't interrupt too much. Uh, but welcome again to this crazy ride I've decided to take called my genealogy experiment. We're here to talk about genealogy, so let's get on with it. But first, I wanted to share with you some of the struggles that I had in getting this, my podcast, up and going. So when I got the thought to make a podcast, um... I thought, okay, well, I got to research how I want to do that. And I'm really sorry, but right now my cat's like really wanting to be involved in this. So I'm going to push him to the side and keep going. But I wanted to figure out how I could do that. And by making, making the podcast, not pushing my cat away. But luckily, all my Macs come with recording software called GarageBand. Um, so my recording while I'm on my Mac, what we call my Mac mini, which is a desktop, I can take the recording and edit it on my laptop or on my iPad, or if my cat will let me finish this, because right now he's seeing all the bars go by on the sound, and he thinks it's something for him to play with. So you're probably going to be able to hear him, and I'm really sorry. But GarageBand is awesome because it's free and I can use it for the most part very easily. But my recording knowledge and interaction is very limited. So it's been a learning curve on how to learn how to use it. I want to sound as professional as possible. So I decided I needed intro music and ending music. I had to learn how to cut it down and insert it, which was really a lot of fun. I tested some scripts out and I borrowed a mic from my daughter, Megan, so that I could practice. And then my lovely husband, Chris, gifted me a mic for Christmas. So I had the podcast part down, so to speak. Now I just had to figure out what to do with it. In doing my research, I had learned that there are a lot of podcast services out there right now, which is great. What's not so great is that they can dictate how your podcast is presented on sites like Amazon or Apple, um, Spotify. And unless you buy into their services, your podcast might only be present for a short time. I did not want this. I wanted to control where I uploaded it, how long it was there for, forever, I hope. And what was I going to do about it? So I went directly to Apple, Amazon, Spotify, SoundCloud, all the sites that house podcasts in the attempt to see what I had to do to get my podcast uploaded to them. Each and every one of them said, what's your podcast RSS feed? Uh, Say what? I had not really ever heard of an RSS feed. So, of course, I went to my tech guru, my husband, and I said, what's an RSS feed? And he said that an RSS feed is what takes your information and makes it so that it can go into a website. In short, layman's terms. So, great. Now I need an RSS feed. In my research, I discovered that I needed to upgrade my website to handle said RSS feed. So I did that. And lucky me, or so I thought, WordPress uh, works with a podcast site to which I could put the podcasts on and they could seamlessly be intertwined. Uh, Yeah, but all that seamlessness doesn't come free. And I'd already taken the time to upgrade my website. And as I've said before, I'm not doing this to make money, but it seemed like I kept throwing money after money after money. And it's like, 
I got to draw a line here somewhere. So let me see if mm-hmm. I can do this myself. All week last week, I worked and worked to try to figure out how to get the podcast out there. And then my son-in-law at dinner said, why don't you just upload it to YouTube? Well, why not upload it to YouTube? I already had a YouTube channel, but this was going to change. And I'll tell you why in a minute. The podcast was all done. All I needed to do was input the audio into my movie maker and make it into a movie. So now I was committing to putting my podcast on YouTube. And as I made it into a movie and was uploading it into my channel, I thought, hmm, you know what? You've made a new Facebook page. You made an Instagram account. Maybe you should make a YouTube page dedicated to your genealogy website. So I did at 10 p.m. on Saturday night, which I would not recommend. It took me a while to get it all set up the way that I needed to get it set up. And then I had to get it verified. Because you see, I uploaded my little blog videos from my reviews from 2020, 2021, or maybe it was 2021 and 2022. And they were fine because they were tiny. They were short. But when I went to upload my podcasts, it said... Uh, you do not have the ability to upload such a long video. You need to get verified. (sighs) So just one more thing that I had to do, but I did it and I uploaded my video. Now, (sighs) Sunday came and I was waiting for them to be published. So note to self, Don't wait to have them be published. Just publish them right away. Because if you guys subscribe to my YouTube channel, you're going to get them when I publish them. You're going to get notified. And that is just a little extra for you. Hey. But otherwise, they'll be published when I publish my blog. So I got the videos into the blog pages. I posted the blog pages. And now I was on Facebook and Instagram. Did you know that when you make a non-personal Facebook account, you make posts in a different way? I did not know this. I have never done the posts um, other than on my personal Facebook page. But I learned how to do it very quickly and got the posts on the Facebook page and got them posted. Then I moved to the Instagram page. And it wasn't until I started trying to post on the Instagram account that I thought, "Mm, you know what, you really should link these because then you could just make one post and it goes to both places. But too bad, so sad for me. Um, I had already posted the Facebook pages so I could not easily post to an Instagram page. So there being done this week for the first time. No biggie, right? And I thought, oh great. I've learned everything that I need to do. I'm live. I got my blogs posted. I got Facebook posted. I got the podcast posted. And it was great. The best feeling I've had in such a long time. And you know what? My blog uh, traffic last week doubled. Doubled. I went from about 20 views on average prior, you know, back in 22 and 21 when I was posting, to 46 views this week. And I can't wait. Hopefully, we're just going to see those numbers rise, right? And I figured out that I need to do something midweek, maybe on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, and just go on and say hi, you know, see how you guys are all doing. And guess what? Aside from my dogs and my cats wanting to be involved in the recordings, even the recording this week has been easier. And since I'm supposed to talk about this week's postings, I better get on to it. 
On the Jordans and Birds page, we have Anna Winky Birds obituary. Say that 10 times fast. She died January 17, 1962. Her obituary is from, I believe, the Peoria Journal Star. Thank you, Wilma. When I know dates are from photos or newspaper clippings that I have, I like to post them during the month that they occurred. And since January 17th is this week, it just made sense that we were going to post her, her obituary this week. Anna Winky Bird was born on February 26th, 1891 in Guide Rock, Nebraska. She was the youngest child of George D. Winky and Marie Butel. Her father died when she was only 19 months old, and her family returned to Peoria, Illinois, as the farm in Nebraska was too much for her mother and siblings to maintain independently. Anna married her husband, Frank, in Chicago on July 26, 1916. They had known each other from Peoria, and they were both 25 years old at the time of their marriage. They remained in Chicago until shortly after our Jean was born in 1920. Anna had returned to Peoria to um, have Jean, and then she returned to Chicago for about a year and a half. According to Jean, her mother came from a German family. Jean called Anna's personality high strung. She went on to explain that Anna had very high expectations for herself and others. And when others did not live up to those expectations, she could be mean. Anna had attended Miss Hyde's sewing school and was a seamstress by trade. Anna made all of Jean's clothing, and she was also a very talented pianist. Jean talked of remembering whenever she was ill that Anna would lay her on the fold-out sofa, and Jean would ask her to play the piano. The Burning of Rome was one of the songs that she would play. If you're curious as to what the Burning of Rome sounds like, just go over to the blog post page. I've inputted um, a link to a YouTube video of a gentleman playing the Burning of Rome. Jean told me that she thought it sounded like um, the songs that they'd play during the silent movies. Anna was also very disciplined and talented and made good use of her time. Throughout Jean's life, Anna did specific tasks on specific days. For example, on Mondays, she would always do the laundry. On Tuesday, she would iron. On Wednesday, she would bake, and so on and so on. Anna was very thoughtful and did not always understand when others were not as thoughtful as she was. She enjoyed making cookies and cakes, and at Christmas time, they would take them around to the elderly relations. She would also make coffee cake every Friday night for breakfast on Saturday mornings. And at election time, Anna served on her local precinct committee. She would help out on election day, getting people checked in to vote, assisting with voting if needed, and then counting the ballots. She was also very active in the Peoria Republican Party. As I said, Anna died on Wednesday, January 17, 1962. Based on family stories, I do not believe that the union of Frank and Anna was a love match. However, for whatever reason, they chose to remain married and made their marriage work for 45 years. They would visit Jean and the grandchildren daily, often together. While they had not shared a bedroom, on the last night of her life, they did. I wonder if it brought peace to Frank that they had spent this last time together. I hope so. The burial of Anna was on a very cold and windy day. My mother talks about that day saying that it was cold and that there had been a snowstorm. The cemetery where Anna is buried is hilly and not far from the Illinois River in Peoria. They could not walk up the hill due to the snow, so had to take the hearse up 
and then walk the casket down to her gravesite. Now over on the Miller garden page, we have Eunice, Miller, and myself. The photo that I've posted makes me feel special. I was a very cute child, so feel free to go and check it out. The reason that I feel special is the look on my grandma's face, the love that I see there. I'm not saying that my relationship with her was sunshine and smiles, because we definitely had our struggles. My brother Mark and I, I know, were a handful. And I remember times like when I rang the bell outside her back door or accidentally caused the truck she had driven to the top of the hill to come out of park or just not wanting to do what was asked of me. But at the end of the day, I always felt her love for me. Like many from her era, Eunice was not a professor of loving words. She was raised in a time when children should be seen and not heard. I never asked her what her relationship with her parents was like. She'd tell me stories about them, but never how she felt or how they treated her. They were her parents. She would always talk about not being the one to work in the fields. Her job was to cook for the family. And while she would say it proudly, I always felt that she had a bit of sadness about that fact too like she'd gotten left behind. Eunice could be very hard to love, and her personality was too much for some people. She was not afraid to share her opinion or her feelings or even how she felt you should behave. As someone who can also be a lot, I can commiserate with how she may feel. Many times it was just her and us, my brother Mark and I. But sometimes I got lucky when she'd come and visit and it would just be her and I. She liked to talk about Kermit and her father, her grandmother, what her life was like, and I liked to listen. It wasn't until I became a grandmother that I thought, really thought about how I wanted my grandchildren and my children to feel, especially when remembering me. It doesn't matter what photo I see with Eunice in it. Her love is right there, shining back at me. And even at the end, when her memories and her personality shifted, I still felt love from her. She couldn't have told me how we were related, but I felt she knew that we were family. My hope is that my brothers and my cousins feel the same way I do about Eunice but I know that they had their own relationships with her, and some of those were strained. I witnessed my brother Isaac struggle to really find shared interests with her or topics that he and she could discuss. And while they were never able to grow their relationship, I don't think for a moment that it stopped Eunice from loving him or anyone else in the family. While I miss receiving that love from her, I feel so blessed to have these photos so I know that this is how I want my grandchildren to feel when they think of me and know that I was so loved. My last post for today is for the Six Degrees of Anderson page. It is a photo of my husband Chris and his great-grandmother Hazel Katz, which was taken in 1973. And some people seem larger than life itself. And even though I have never met her, I am convinced that Hazel was such a person. Her demeanor in photos indicates that she was in charge, no matter the situation. Hazel May Lundberg was born May 17, 1897 in Riley, Kansas. Riley is a town that is northwest of Manhattan, Kansas, and Manhattan is west of Kansas City and Topeka, and home to K-State, Kansas State University, that is. She was born to William and Emma Lundberg, and she was the sixth of seven children born to them. Hazel married Ross McDonald in December of 1915, 
and divorced him three years later in December of 1918. Our June was born on June 18, 1916. I'll let you do the math for that. As, so after divorcing Ross, Hazel married August Audie Katz in October of 1919. Arjun told me that in her mother's photo album, there were old photos that looked like someone had been cut out of the images. And we assumed that that someone was Hazel's first husband, Ross. Hazel had three more children with Audie, uh, Robert, Donald, and William all brothers to June. Chris and Kirk have very fond memories of Hazel. Chris remembers playing canasta with her in her retirement home and claims that they could not be beaten and possibly that some betting may have been going on, but he never saw it. Kirk got to drive her car a couple times. I guess it was a massive, massive car and it did not have power steering. Do you know what it's like to drive a car that doesn't have power steering? I bet that's a ride that Kirk will not forget. Hazel looks really casual as she's holding Chris in her arms. And every photo I see of her, she always comes across as extremely chic and very fashionable. Chris, on the other hand, seems highly mischievous. In any case, we are blessed to have this photo of them together. Those people who are prominent in life leave large holes when they are gone, and I am sure this is the case when Hazel passed. May we always remember her and pass her life stories down to future generations so that they too may be large in life. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you have enjoyed your time with me as much as I have enjoyed talking with you. Please make sure if you're watching this on YouTube, that you like and subscribe and feel free to share with anyone you know who might enjoy this. Join me each week as I discuss those photos I posted in the family blogs and maybe some other things as well. We'll see where this road takes us. My name is Michelle Anderson. Thank you for listening. I am the link to the past and the bridge to the future. Have a great day.